Hello, everyone. I'm Gary Seymour, director of the Cran Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis. Thank you very much for joining our webinar today. Our speaker is Michael Gordon, national security correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. And Michael's going to speak to us today about his new book, Degrade and Destroy, the inside story of the war against the Islamic State from Barack Obama to Donald Trump. This is the fourth book that Michael has written about the wars in Iraq, starting with the first Gulf War in 1991 through the US invasion in 2003, occupation and withdrawal from Iraq. And this book, the latest book, picks up the story in 2014 with the Islamic State's uh, dramatic rise to power and conquest of territory and establishment of the caliphate and tells the inside story within the US military, within the US government, between the US and its local partners and the involvement of other countries in the region, including Iran uh, and Russia that led ultimately to the destruction of the caliphate. If you take these four books together, they really represent the most comprehensive and incisive chronicle of US wars in Iraq. And in some ways, this latest one tells the most interesting story because it was more demanding than the other wars in terms of the requirement for partnership with local parties who did much of the heavy lifting in the fighting. So uh, Michael's gonna talk about his book and then we'll have a brief conversation and then I'll turn to questions from the audience. So please put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, so Michael, over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Gary, for the opportunity and thank you to the viewers out there. Um, the way um, we're gonna proceed is exactly the way Gary said we would. Um, I'm gonna talk for 15 or 20 minutes and explain uh, what I think is um, why I wrote the book and what I th the themes I was trying to get across and um, some of the news in there perhaps. And uh, Gary will ask me some questions and then I'll happy to take any questions from, from uh, viewers on, on the content of this or any of my previous books. So I'm based in Washington usually. Right now I'm here uh, at Brandeis, but um, and in, in Washington at the Pentagon, the focus these days is on what uh, used to be called their great power competition, China and Russia. China is the pacing threat. Russia is the acute threat. American defense structure is transforming uh, to, to deal with these um, perspective threats. And that's the, the main business of the Pentagon these days. But uh, the Middle East hasn't gone away. And um, neither is Operation Inherent Resolve, which is the counter ISIS campaign. In fact, that campaign continues to this day. It was, um, it's been largely successful. Uh, the cal physical caliphate that ISIS had has been uh, destroyed, but there are 2,500 uh, troops in Iraq, 900 in Syria. There are military operations that are being carried out. Some are being done with partner forces. Some are being done unilaterally. Uh, not so long ago, four U.S. troops were wounded in an, in an operation uh, in Syria, and nearly 700 ISIS were killed in uh, Iraq and Syria last year. So there's more activity going on in this wrapping up of this uh, conflict than people uh, might surmise. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Pentagon has never done a uh, comprehensive lessons learned history of what happened in Operation Inherent Resolve, which is what the counter ISIS campaign uh, was named. Uh, there is no, um, there's a Pentagon IG reports, there's a RAND Corporation study of some of the air war um, aspects of the air war, but there hasn't been a good look at it by the Defense Department or a serious one by uh, the US Army uh, for that matter. And that's unfortunate because um, this, uh, campaign against ISIS, uh, first of all, was a success. It was done at a uh, low cost in terms of American lives, about 20 uh, killed in action, which is around the number that were lost in the invasion of Panama. Um, it was um, uh, achieved without 
taking on the enduring responsibilities of occupation. And there's, you know, a lot of people think that all of the American interventions in the Middle East have failed because the intervention in Afghanistan failed. But the interventions in Iraq did not fail militarily. And the operation against uh, ISIS, by any reasonable standard, was successful, although, as I noted, um, it uh, still requires continued effort to uh, solidify that success. Now, um, you know, what are, how did I go about writing this, this book? Uh, when I did all of these, all of these books, uh, as a journalist, first for 32 years for the New York Times, and now five years at the Wall Street Journal, um, in the seven wars I've been in on the ground, um, you know, my approach was you get, you get a close up view of, of the battlefield as a, uh, as a journalist, and you see a lot of drama and a lot of tragedy and a lot of action, but you're always sort of wondering, well, what really uh, lies behind this? What were the decisions made and unmade? What were the strategic choices? How did this really get put together and how did it unfold? And so what I would would do is I would go back and forth between, um, well, where the place where the war was taking place in Washington and try to uh, assemble uh, my understanding of the policy in Washington and my understanding of the re battlefield realities in, in, in Iraq or Syria and, and put the, the two together in, in books that took some time to assemble. In this case, it took about six years. Um, and uh, that practice was enabled in the past uh, by uh, this process you've probably all heard about of embedding where U.S. correspondence would uh, be inserted inside U.S. military combat units, and we get to see things firsthand. Uh, unfortunately, um, that process is now defunct and still doesn't exist to this day. In fact, the Pentagon wouldn't allow me to embed with U.S. forces in Poland for uh, a relatively benign mission that's ongoing now to uh, maintain deterrent capability as the Ukraine conflict unfolds. But in this conflict, there was a way to get around that. Even though the U.S. military wouldn't allow me to embed, um, the partner forces would. In this case, the Peshmerga and the Iraqi Counterterrorism Service. They were they were happy to take correspondence as close as you wanted to be, and maybe close than you should have been. Um, and so that gave me some uh, uh, understanding of what was happening on the ground. And I did also benefit from uh, having access to the commanders and when they traveled around Iraq, what was called battlefield circulation. So taking uh, those experiences and and my research in Washington, the Pentagon and elsewhere, I, I tried to put this together. A lot of interviews also with the uh, Iraqis and Syrians and uh, Kurdish elements of in Iraq and Syria on how they all fought the war. Now, I have... Um, uh, some important themes I think I, I pulled out of this, which is this conflict in, in Iraq, um, as uh, Gary pointed out, is very different from all the previous wars I had covered in Iraq. And in fact, uh, it's described as, uh, in terms of the military, conflict of by, with, and through. And what does that really mean? It means, in, in certainly, in Desert Storm, when U.S. evicted um, Saddam Hussein's troops from Kuwait, a massive force was deployed. I was there for that. It was Colin Powell's kind of overwhelming force. And in the invasion of Iraq, uh, certainly it was the Americans did the main fighting in the invasion and uh, and, and, and dealing with the insurgency that followed. But by design, uh, in this conflict, uh, President Obama decided he did not want to send U.S. forces back into ground combat. Um, that wasn't always observed. And I note the examples that Washington never acknowledged where um, uh, U.S. forces did um, participate in ground combat in the Battle of Mosul. But it was largely observed. And so that meant... Um, uh, the, the main ground combat elements in this force were the Iraqi forces and the, the Kurdish Peshmerga and, and in Syria, a force that we had never uh, had any experience with prior to this conflict, the, um, uh, the SDF. And, and that, so we fought, they, they did the fighting. The fighting was done by them with American support and through a policy and legal framework. Um, and there's some important lessons that um, I think come out of this experience that have applicability 
for a, a different, uh, a wide range of scenarios. Um, and what are those scenarios? Uh, the um, the scenario they are well future Middle East contingencies. If you go on the assumption that the principal Pentagon focus these days is on China and Russia, and that's uh, that's what the strategy calls for, then uh, and that all the problems in the Middle East aren't going to go away, then you have to have a, a, a mode of warfare to deal with those kind of contingencies that is not troop intensive. And the strategy that was employed against ISIS, where we had relatively small U.S. teams advising uh, local forces and calling in considerable amount of American air power and relying on American intelligence um, and uh, surveillance, uh, provides a model for how to do this in the future um, if we want to keep our principal focus in China. It's a more economical way of doing it, not in terms of budgets, but in in terms of forces used, and we don't have all those many forces to go around. So that's one reason it's relevant to the future. Another reason it's relevant is, I would argue, that variants of this strategy also have applicability in great power uh, context. For example, if you look at Ukraine, which I've done some reporting on, okay, we don't have U.S. troops in Ukraine, but we're some elements of by, with, and through are at play here. We're advising the Ukrainian military. We're providing them with weapons, arms, and intelligence. Um, so, you know, if you're um, confronting a, a peer competitor like Russia that's a nuclear power, you may uh, want to rely more on your partner forces and less on direct U.S. forces if you're trying to mitigate the prospects of escalation uh, to nuclear weapons, which is exactly what the approach the U.S. is taking now in Ukraine. Back to the, the conflict with ISIS, you know, so how was this really done? Well, one thing that's really interesting about this campaign and which I spent a lot of time tracking down was how it evolved over time. Um, the White House was rather surprised when ISIS took Mosul. It shouldn't have been because U.S. special operators had sent messages up the chain of command in February of 2014 that ISIS was coming on strong that were largely ignored in Washington, but it did come as a, a surprise. And uh, a strat President Obama, to his credit, sent ad advisors back um, to Iraq, but initially there were a lot of constraints on how they could operate. And it took years really for the strategy to evolve. And what were really the important steps that, that made that strategy work? Well, one was, um, uh, to uh, initially the advisors were restricted uh, in where they could go. They had to operate within the confines of large military bases. And it wasn't really until uh, 2016 that advisors were allowed to accompany uh, Iraqi forces uh, onto the battlefield at the battalion level. And that proved to be a necessary step and that was built on in, um, in, in Mosul. So that was an important step. Uh, the use of air power changed uh, pretty significantly during the course of the war. Initially, it was very tactical, focused on the front lines. It hit hitting targets that the Air Force dismissively called nefarious dirt. But over time, it became more strategic, and it went after ISIS as a proto-state, hitting their banks, or what the military called bulk cash storage, their, their energy supply, their oil business, um, their leadership. Uh, that, that took some time to elaborate those authorities and uh, develop um uh the campaign um and but there are also some lessons about the um well what can be done and what can't be done uh in these kinds of wars when you're when the your partners are the main forces on the ground and uh you you're not playing the direct combat role on the ground and gary let's see if we can um fire up the slides and see if we can get those to work through your shared screen and i can kind of talk the viewers through a few of those. So um, so that's the first slide. Let's leave that up for a second. That was taken by Colonel Pat, now General Pat Work, who was the key U.S. Army uh, uh, advisor uh, to Abdul Lamir, who was the Iraqi commander for Mosul. And it's basically welcome to Mosul sign <laughs> uh, done by the um, is Islamic State um, and sort of on, on the outskirts. And um, and now uh, go to the uh, second slide, please. Um, now, that in a very schematic way is the, the battle for East Mosul. 
And what is interesting about it, if you just take a look at it, is in, in that those big arrow diagrams, what you see is an Iraqi army that's um, each unit is sort of fighting its own war. There are many different elements of the Iraqi security forces as the Iraqi army, there's a counterterrorism service, the federal police. And in that early stage of the Mosul fight, the US had a different strategy in mind. It wanted to make these more of combined units and the Iraqis wouldn't go for that for a whole variety of reasons, mostly bureaucratic and internal. And it shows that sometimes when you're the advisor, you can't you can't call the shops. You can't instruct your partner on what to do. You can uh, uh, coax them. You can try to persuade them. But in this case, um, the Iraqis fought the battle for Mosul on their own, and it went a lot. Uh, it was a lot more difficult than they anticipated. In fact, um, I was there at the at, for the opening part of it. And uh, they ran into um, a lot of resistance at um, uh, the 9th Iraqi Army Division at a hospital in, in Mosul that had been an ISIS command post and were essentially routed. And what happened at that point was um, the U.S. military pretty much overhauled its approach for how it uh, was dealing with the Iraqis. It began to move advisors forward uh, on the battlefield to employ Apache helicopters. Uh, more uh, aggressively and basically to um, position itself more in the field with the Iraqi forces and less uh, further back. And that was necessary both to, in a military sense, to call in airstrikes more efficiently, but also to build and strengthen relationships with your partner force. Uh, and Gary, Gary, please uh, go on to the uh, next slide. No, no, that's, yeah. So um, when it came time for West Mosul, um, uh, the U.S. advisory and partnership relationship with the Iraqis had evolved considerably under General uh, Townsend, and uh, there were advisors that also, and there had been additional forces had been put into the mix by Washington, and they were able to expand the, the levels at which advising was being carried out. And so they were uh, helping the Iraqis more and also building up some sort of street cred with them by uh, being present for on the battlefield and sharing some of the risk. And when the battle for West Mosul uh, started, you see the arrow sort of in the bo bottom. Well, all the forces were down at the bottom uh, pushing up. And there was a phase in April uh, 2017 when there was actually, they were actually stuck. And I was out there during that time. It was around the time Jared Kushner visited, you may recall. And uh, the uh, battle was, um, moving very slowly, all the Iraqi forces were pushing up from the south and uh, ISIS pretty much anticipated that they were very uh, dug in and the US wanted to change the strategy. And at that time, as I said, you, I couldn't embed with the forces, but I, you could travel around with the commanders. And from sort of pure happenstance, I ended up in a meeting with General Townsend and the Iraqi prime minister and all the top um, Iraqi commanders at Haman al, Haman al Alil, which is a base south of Mosul, uh, that uh, hadn't really anticipated, and General Townsend hadn't either. He was meeting with Iraqi commanders, and the prime minister showed up. And I watched a rather spirited debate over the strategy and what they should do. And at that time, the Iraqis um, were a, a, a little bit unsure about what to do next. The Americans wanted them to open up a, a northern front and come at. Uh, ISIS from both sides. But like I said, you can't dictate to your partner. You can only uh, kind of coax them and persuade them and, and patiently um, uh, try to walk them through your logic and see if they embrace it and also make yourself vital to them so that they understand they need you and therefore they should listen uh, to your message. And that's what happened in this case. Within a few weeks, the, the arrows you're seeing in this diagram uh, was precisely the kind of campaign that uh, uh, earlier, just a few weeks earlier, the Iraqi generals were a little reluctant to undertake. But when the Americans briefed them on the intelligence about how this would hold down their casualties and make go the, the war go more quickly, um, you know, uh, they embraced it. And it led to um, a rather speedy collapse of ISIS in West Mosul, though with um, some significant uh, destruction uh, to the city uh, due to the amount of air power that had to be employed and firepower really on all sides. So um, there are a couple lessons here. I mean, 
what helps, what makes a campaign like this succeed? Well, one, in this instance, an American role was indispensable. People say, could this have been done without the United States? The answer is no. Um, not only did the U.S. provide the air power and the intelligence, uh, it's still providing the intelligence to the Iraqi forces and helping them with airstrikes, but um, they were kind of the glue that held this uh, odd coalition together. I mean, the American, the Iraqi security forces are not one thing. They're the Iraqi army, the counterterrorism service, the federal police. Well, the Americans, they all report to different ministries. The Americans could operate with all of these different elements and help them coordinate uh, more effectively. Also, uh, Iraq, as I'm sure this audience knows, um, the, uh, the the Kurdish uh, KRG, the Kur semi-autonomous region of Kurdistan in northern Iraq, has a fraught relationship with the authorities in Baghdad. And just getting the Kurdish Peshmerga in Iraq to to work uh, efficiently with the Iraqi security forces really took the Americans as uh, almost an intermediary and a glue to kind of hold that together. And in the case of Syria, uh, there was no government forces to work with. So the Americans had to basically find one, which it did through the good offices of some elements of the um, uh, Kurdish commanders in Iraq. So America had an indispensable political role and, and military role, but it, it wouldn't have worked if we didn't have a partner on the ground that had some degree of capability um, had some degree was respected sufficiently respected in their um, local um, communities had a had a fair amount of um, uh, credibility uh, uh, with the local populations and um, and was uh, you know motivated enough uh, to carry out the fight which which was on really 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 difficult um, circumstances. Um, another factor was in the campaign against ISIS, uh, from the very get-go, the Obama administration decided uh, there wouldn't uh, leave a sanctuary, which meant uh, there would be airstrikes and eventually U.S. forces in Syria. Um, some of these reasons explains why the war against ISIS worked and the war in Afghanistan didn't work, which is something we could take up um, in the Q&A. But now let's go to the last slide, please, uh, Gary, um, which is the photograph. So this campaign, as I said, is not over. And that's a very dramatic photo that was taken of um, ISIS families leaving Baghuz, which was really ISIS's last stand in Syria, um, and a very difficult fight. And... Um, those people are still in Syria. There's uh, 10,000 ISIS fighters in detention in Syria, guarded by the SDF. Um, there's probably about 50,000 refugees, um, female ISIS fighters, people trapped in horrible situations in a refugee camp in Al Hol, Syria. And it's not clear what, what can be done with them. Some small portion have been repatriated uh to iraq and other countries some western countries have been reluctant to take back their own foreign fighters um that's an, another lingering problem this is the unfinished business of the campaign and it it's important to keep this in mind because um the um you know should events in syria go haywire and syria is a place where that can happen uh through a turkish intervention or other means um, the ISIS prisoners in detention and the, the people who are in the Al-Hol camp, um, well, they might uh, become free in, in some way without any kind of processing. And, and uh, that's, that's not a, a far-fetched uh, scenario. And also, it's just a, a moral responsibility the international community has to try to uh, wrap this up and take find out who are the innocents at uh, the Al-Hol camp who are still culpable and uh, figure out a, a lasting solution so at a time when all of our folk attention is um focused on ukraine or um chinese balloons or um any uh russian um uh, clumsy uh aerial stunts like crashing into a, an american drone over the black sea it's important to remember 
that as successful as the the ice counter ISIS campaign was, and it was successful, there's important work yet to do to solidify uh, this um, uh, victory militarily, politically, and also uh, morally. And so at that point, I think, uh, Gary, I'll take your questions and those of the um, audience as well. Thank you, Michael. That was a terrific overview. I have lots of questions. I'm going to ask a few. I encourage uh, participants to uh, put their questions in the Q&A, and I will relay them to Michael. Uh, Michael, I want to take the story back to Washington. Uh, as you describe in the book, the strategy that developed under Obama was more or less carried through by Trump. But in your inside story, you detail the differences in terms of civil military relations uh, during the uh, uh, Obama administration and during the Trump administration and how the military tried to manage the White House and how the White House tried to direct the military. And I uh, myself thought it was a fascinating story of civil military relations. So let me ask you to uh, contrast uh, the Obama administration approach and the Trump administration approach when it came to uh, civil military relations. Well, uh, they were really uh, polar opposites. Uh, what happened during the Obama administration was the White House kept a very tight grip on, on military operations. In fact, uh, so tight it was sometimes accused uh, correctly of micromanaging them, uh, at least by the military. And it's, which means you, you don't just give the military the order to take this or that objective, but you get into a review of tactics. At one point um, during the Obama administration, the US military wanted to employ Apache helicopters in Syria because they needed the firepower. They didn't want approval from the White House to do this. This was toward the end of the administration. But the uh, requirement was they could only um, have three helicopters in Syria at one time for 72 hours at a time, and then they had to go back to Erbil. And this is because the Obama administration was very conscious about not getting too heavily engaged. It was trying to find the balance between applying enough power but not getting um, caught up into what they feared would be a quagmire. And that's understandable. But initially, um, the the, um, the Obama, President Obama drew drew the line that it was really the restrictions were really too tight. And it really slowed down the campaign. It was hard to, if you can't accompany Iraqi forces in the field, you can't build trust with them, and you can't just be as effective militarily. And it took a couple of years, really, to get to that point. To President Obama's credit, he sent the advisors back. To his credit, he um, gradually added more forces, and he uh, pretty much went along with what the military said, but it took a, a few years to get to that point. What concentrated minds in Washington was when there were the terrorist attacks in Paris in November 2015. The going in assumption at the White House had been that ISIS was like the Taliban. They were a threat to the people in Iraq, but not to us. And after the uh, ISIS-led attacks in Paris in 2015, the White House revised its assumptions and said, oh no, they could do external attacks. We better speed up the campaign. So all in all, that's how the Obama administration approached it. It ended up in the right place, but it took too long to get there. Uh, President Trump gave the military a much freer hand. Uh, he didn't get involved in reviewing um, tactics and H.R. McMaster was a national security advisor. He also, uh, as a military person, would left that up to the the uh, troops in the field. And uh, But um, President Trump did not create a whole new strategy. In fact, he, I, he didn't change the strategy in any significant way. And I, during the campaign, he talked about he had a secret plan to overhaul the strategy. None of that happened. Um, it was basically what President Trump did was he carried out the Obama administration strategy somewhat more efficiently than President Obama himself because he dispensed with any White House oversight. But there was a drawback to his approach, which is that he became disengaged from what was happening on the ground. And he made uh, two impulsive decisions to remove U.S. forces from Syria that were disconnected 
from where the um, the battlefield situation in Syria at that time, and each of which he had to reverse and had to be talked into reversing once he better understood the situation at hand. So I, I think probably the ideal commander in chief would be somewhere, somebody in the middle, somebody who um, was in control of the situation, resisted the temptation to micromanage it, but uh, kept his eye on the ball and knew what was going on uh, before they, he made decisions. Thank you. Um, one other uh, question I have is about the role of Iran. The US uh, felt compelled to mobilize efforts when ISIS captured Mosul and threatened to take over, over other parts of Iraq. And Iran also felt threatened and of course played a role in forming the uh, popular mobilization militia, mainly Shia militia, and even participated in some of the fighting. And in the book, you have some fascinating accounts of the interaction between the Americans and the Iranians. And I want you to just talk about this kind of strange bella, bedfellows alliance that came together against a common enemy. I think alliance is too strong. I think what happened in the early days is there was a live and let live policy of deconfliction. But what happened, um, Gary, is early on, US intelligence picked up um, good indications that Qasem Soleimani, the Quds Force commander, saw the American return uh, to Iraq, even in the form of advisors to help the Iraqis fight ISIS as a potential threat to Iran. Iran's objective is to get the Americans out of the Middle East and certainly out of Iraq. Um, and they, he saw this as a setback. But then his views evolved. And uh, he, he began to see the Americans from an Iranian perspective as a necessary evil. Only the Americans had the capability to defeat ISIS with our combined arms warfare and our ISR and intelligence and air power and, and, and uh, firepower, really. And so what happened was uh, in the early period is you had um, Iranian uh, Quds Force forces, Qasem Soleimani himself, and uh, advisors in, a, in Iraq. You had American forces in Iraq um, staying out of each other's way and operating um, independently. In fact, I had a, a story at one point, um, the uh, uh, Iranians sent up a drone unit to do battlefield surveillance at Camp Red Catcher, which had been American forward operating base, which I think was the first instance in which the Iranians took over a Amer former American base in Iraq to use for for their efforts against ISIS. And so this policy persisted for a while. And uh, but it, it and in fact, there's an episode that never previously been reported that I recount in the book where Qasem Soleimani himself is led into a joint command center in Baghdad in 2015, Union 3, it's across the street from the American embassy, and introduced to a one-star uh, US Marine commander, uh, Robert Castelvi, and they had a discussion. And uh, it, it was not an encounter that Castelvi had anticipated. Uh, he was brought into the room by uh, Abdul Amir, the Iraqi commander, and said, here's somebody you should meet. And it was mostly about uh, where who was where on the battlefield. It was ported up the chain of the command. Uh, ironically, uh, Qasem Soleimani was later killed not so far from there, probably just a few miles away when uh, President Trump ordered a drone attack uh, against him. But by that time, relationships had soured. And the Iranian calculation was they happy to see the Americans there to do the heavy lifting and fighting ISIS. But once um, the war was won, they would return to their project of encouraging attacks against American troops by the militias they arm and back to try to get Americans out of uh, Iraq. And that's kind of where they are today. They're, they've cooled it a little bit in Iraq now, but they haven't cooled it in Syria. And they've been some attacks against Don Tomf Garrison in Green Village where American forces are in Syria. Low level attacks done by militias, usually involving rockets and drones, but this sort of shadow war um, continues to this day. It'll be interesting to see if there's any change in light of this uh, so-called uh, um, Iranian-Saudi uh, uh, rapprochement. So follow-up question from uh, Nader Habibi here at the Crown Center. You've partially addressed this. 
how did the U.S. try to balance its efforts to defeat ISIS uh, against its efforts to contain Iranian influence in Syria and in Iraq? Were these two in conflict? Were they, these two objectives seen as supporting each other? What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, first of all, the U.S., um, for a period of years, um, didn't interfere with the Iranians as long as they didn't interfere with us in Iraq. And the U.S. was still the big military player. But, um, you know, I, there were even examples of some sort of tacit uh, cooperation in this sense. Um, at one point, an American commander in Iraq, Dana Petard, mentioned to the Iraqi Interior Ministry that there were some targets near the border with Iran that would be nice if someone could get them, anticipating that that information would be funneled to, to Tehran, since the Interior Ministry has always been close to Iran. And indeed it was, and those things were taken care of. But by a large first stage was they stayed out of each other's way. Second, the U.S. contained the influence by restricting its air support, the U.S. would provide air support for Iraqi security forces, but not for these so-called popular mobilization forces, these militias that um, uh, Iran backed, but some of them were actually organized uh, in the Jaff. They weren't all Iranian proxies, but it withheld support from those units, which diminished their military utility. So the U.S. only backed Iraqi security forces, not the Iranian-backed forces with air power. Um, so that was another way of trying to limit uh, their influence. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, you know, there's uh, U.S. Is, has a presence now in uh, southeastern Syria at the al Tamf garrison, which is near the intersection of Jordan, Iraq, and, um, and um, in Syria. It's in Syrian territory. And that sits astride of one of the um, main roads, or as the military would call it, line of communication, a lock that goes from uh, Ramadi uh, to Syria. It's regarded as sort of strategic terrain. Now, Iran has a lot of ways of getting around it and funneling support uh, to Syria, much of which the Israelis take care of with their airstrikes. But uh, that presence there is uh, although initially justified as necessary to counter ISIS, uh, continues to exist because it's um, a way to, to a certain degree, uh, maintain hem in Iran or, or at least make it slightly more difficult for them to funnel support to their Hezbollah and other militias they're supporting in, in, in Syria. So I have a question from Peter Krauss, who uh, who's a faculty lead fellow here at the Crown Center. He points out that the U.S. effort in Afghanistan was in some ways similar to what the U.S. employed against ISIS, an effort to try to partner American air power and intelligence with local forces. And of course, in the case of Afghanistan, as you mentioned yourself, that failed and the local forces crumbled once the U.S. support had been withdrawn. So uh, Peter's question is, to what extent does this Iraq model, to what extent is it really applicable to other cases? Or was this an instance where there just happened to be local partners with fighting ability and a strong motivation to partner with the US against a common enemy? I mean, that's an excellent question. And I addressed it in a Wall Street Journal article I wrote when the book came out. So I had to think through it. I was in Afghanistan for the whole start of the war. I was at Tora Bora. I was with these Afghan warlords um, because there were no U.S. forces. There was just CIA um, uh, personnel in blue jeans riding on uh, four-wheel uh, bikes trying to be inconspicuous. So um, and so I, I saw the whole opening of the Afghan uh, conflict firsthand and in Kabul and Jalalabad and, and Tora Bora. Um, and I think there, are, so why did it work in Iraq and, and Syria? And why is it, didn't it work in Afghanistan? And I have a couple of thoughts on that. One, um, the US never solved the problem of a sanctuary in Afghanistan. Pakistan remained a sanctuary throughout the entire conflict for Taliban, Haqqani network and, and other forces. And it's very difficult to wage a successful counterinsurgency when your adversary has a sanctuary. Uh, and, and, and so that's one big difference. In the case of 
of um, Operation Inherent Resolve, President Obama resolved to um, carry out airstrikes against um, ISIS from the start in Syria. And um, there was um, U.S. forces were gradually inserted there, Delta Force and then Special Operations Forces. So uh, we didn't let the enemy have a sanctuary. So that's one big difference. An another big difference is I think it, it does depend whether you're um, the credibility. This is why I was trying to get at with the credibility of the force. The force, for all of the problems in Iraq, um, the Iraqi security forces, the counterterrorism service, um, they have credibility in that society, um, at least sufficient credibility and capability and motivation. Uh, they had to be whipped into shape by the U.S. Uh, because the mistake to uh, the withdrawal of U.S. forces in 2011 was an enormous mistake by President Obama and Nouri al-Maliki, which really set some of the conditions uh, that enabled ISIS to make a, a run at uh, Mosul. But, um, you know, we did have decent partners, including in Syria with General Maslum, that had credibility and adhered to a, a sufficient number of our, our, our requirements uh, to make them a respectable ally that we could arm and work with. And in Afghanistan, you didn't really have that to the, to the um, same degree. You didn't have um, partners who enjoyed that degree of support across Afghan society. Lastly, I would point out, the strategy actually was, despite all those problems, the strategy actually kind of was working at the very end um, in the sense that we had 2,500 troops in Afghanistan before President Biden decided to pull them out. That's all we had. And um, and NATO had another 8,000 or so. We didn't have a big force in Afghanistan. We had a small force um, and we were had air power and we had contractor support for the Afghan air. And that was sufficient to preside over a stalemate. So I think what Af the Afghanistan experience shows you is even under unfavorable conditions, a uh, by, with, and through has some potential. It with two, two, 2,500 troops, you can you can have a stalemate, um, uh, even in in that kind of difficult situation. But um, yes, the conditions in Iraq and Syria were much more favorable. So if the local conditions don't support it, you can't just magically make it happen. So we have a question about Turkey, which we haven't, you haven't spoken much about, but of course the US partnering with SDF led to very severe strains in relations between the US and Turkey. And that actually continues to this day. So. Talk about how the U.S. tried to manage and balance its re relations with Turkey, a NATO ally, against the military requirements for working with the Syrian Kurds against ISIS. So this was a, a big concern of the Obama administration. How do you do this? And the relationship with the General Maslum and YPG and the Syrian Democratic Forces was began with uh, Chris Donahue who was the Delta Force commander in Iraq, who met in Suleimania um, in um, 2014 uh, with Muslim and, and uh, discussed a, a plan to take the war into Syria to cut off the flow of foreign fighters that was codenamed Talon Anvil. By the way, this is the same Chris Donahue, who was the last man out in Kabul, and it was the same Chris Donahue, who's now the commander of the 18th Airborne Corps and uh, for a period of time help lead the US effort and support of Ukraine um, out of Germany. Um, and so he forged this relationship, but the question was how, how far to take it? And do you arm the Kurds and uh, the Syrian Kurds? And these are decisions that went down literally to the last week of the Obama administration, which shows you literally the last week, which shows you how difficult it was uh, for them. Um, why did they take this decision? Well, it was militarily necessary because the Turkish military um, lacked the capability to go and will to go after ISIS. Um, um, you know, they kept saying, let us handle it. And the American military kept looking at their performance. And uh, and uh, it didn't appear that they really were, had the capability to go down to Raqqa. They seemed to be more most concerned with presenting the emergence of a Kurdish canton on their border, not really with going after ISIS. In fact, there was some concern the Turks even weren't that worried about ISIS. I, 
um, that they had a kind of modus vivendi where they wouldn't interfere with the foreign fighters and the foreign fighters wouldn't interfere with them. At least Secretary Kerry, as Secretary of State, said that in a, in a meeting, uh, according to the notes I re reviewed. So the U.S. of necessity had to turn to the SDS as a, as a partner. There wasn't, wasn't anybody else. And um, so then it became an exercise in damage limitation and, and mitigation. And initially, under the original plan that Delta Force had, uh, they were going to go to the Euphrates and then head south and not go into Manbij. And this was uh, to um, address Turkish sensitivities. But as it unfolded, it uh, was deemed necessary to go into Manbij, at least with some local forces, if not a significant number of SDF, because the external plotting for the Paris attacks were de were assessed as having been carried out from the planning was done there. And, and then you were in a very difficult situation with the Turks. I would say the U.S. has sought to manage it, but it, it's been it's been uh, very difficult. And when the Turkish forces intervened, I had stayed for a while at the Lafarge cement plant, which was a U.S. command center for the operation um, and coalition, too. And uh, due to one of the Turkish interventions, the U.S. and the SDF had abandoned the far cement plant, and then the U.S. even called in an airstrike and destroyed it for fear that it would fall into Russian hands or ISIS hands or somebody's hands. So it, it's been an uneasy situation um, ever since, uh, but um, one that um, the U.S. is is tried to mitigate, but it, it doesn't seem like there's a, a, a clean solution at hand. So this is a follow-up on that. One of the concerns is that renewed fighting between Turkey and the YPG or SDF could lead to uh, a breakdown of the prison system, where, as you said, many ISIS fighters and families are being held. So what is the U.S. doing to try to avoid or prevent uh, uh, prison breaks uh, from uh, from those former ISIS fighters? Well, there actually was a prison break about a year ago, January, that ISIS, because ISIS plan is to break it. It did it in Iraq during when it was gathering strength in Iraq. They had what was called a breaking the walls campaign where they broke into prisons near Mosul and um, um, Ab Abu Ghraib um, and, uh, prisons in Tikrit and other places. And to replenish their personnel. And that's their strategy here. And they did have a prison break a year ago, January. And several hundred ISIS uh, escapees were killed. And U.S. called in air power and some of its own ground power uh, to assist in that. And um, and some significant number of SDF were killed, over 100. So um, I think it's uh, the U.S. is trying to avert it through by asking Turkey not to do this, but the U.S. is only one player and probably not even the most influential player in Syria these days. I mean, the Russians have a big say in this too, um, and they've been meeting uh, with the Turks. So, so you have a, a, a Syria is in a situation of Syria is extremely complex where the Russians have a say in what's going to happen there. The Russia's turkish dialogue is perhaps as robust as the U.S.-Turkish dialogue on what's, and maybe more so really on, on what's about to un unfold in um in in syria and then assad survived the civil war and came out on top and uh and is trying to maintain his position and israel is carrying out um, a significant number of airstrikes against iranian uh supported elements with u.s acquiescence in in many cases um and even deconfliction procedures so Syria is an arena where you have all these different outside interventions. I don't think the U.S. has a good answer for 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 this, other than to ask the Turks not to undo um, uh, the work that was accomplished uh, in rounding up all these um, as, uh, ISIS fighters, um, and to uh, you know confine its activities to sort of a, a shallow. Uh, uh, border uh, area. So I have a question from the one of the participants about the risk of an ISIS revival and to what extent, not just from a military standpoint, but to what extent do you think 
the local governments are trying to address the ideological uh, roots of support for ISIS and to try to prevent them from being able to have popular support among uh, the population in Syria and Iraq. Well, I haven't been in Syria in a while. And um, and so I don't know what's go really is going on there. From what I read in various reports and things, there there's some ISIS is trying to make a revival. It's hanging on. They've lost a few caliphates. They're down to a few thousand guys. As long as you keep the heat on, you can probably keep their boot on their neck and kind of keep them down. They're they're probably not going to be able to make a, a a significant revival if U.S. forces leave as it was done in 2011, then you've created a vacuum and uh, your ability to help the Iraqis is also much reduced. Um, and uh, and I think they could make a bit of a, a comeback. I think the greater danger from ISIS is ISIS is like Al Qaeda. It's become a brand. So in um, Afghanistan, you have the Khorasan group or as the US military calls it, ISIS-K. And they're a significant um, presence and in fact, there was some concern that when the U.S. left Afghanistan, they might eventually get into external operations as well. Um, fortunately for us, the Taliban and ISIS-K are our enemies and are fighting each other. And uh, so that takes a little bit of the pressure off as long as the Taliban and, and ISIS-K are, are um, killing each other. Uh, we don't have to... Um, worry as much about them, but we still need to try to keep an eye on them, which is not so easy when you're not in the country and your reconnaissance is limited dwell time. Um, and ISIS has become a presence in Africa, you know, it's, it's, uh, and where it's had uh, more success. So, um, you know, are these directed by one mastermind? No, it's, they're sort of like franchises, but um, just like Al Qaeda spawned AQAP and, you know, in Yemen and, you know, some of these ISIS spinoffs, our problems um, in other part of the world. And yes, to that extent, um, the ideology uh, behind it is, uh, is an important motivating factor. Just sticking with Africa for a second, the US is actually trying a similar military strategy to build up and partner with local forces. Do you have any sense of, I mean, we have an example of failure in Afghanistan, success in Iraq. Do you have any sense of how that's working out in Africa? I haven't been in Africa in a while, but I mean, we're having a small brush war in Somalia that isn't noted where there's a lot of um, partner forces are fighting there against the militant groups there and uh, and airstrikes are involved and and uh, it doesn't always get a lot of attention, but um, but because it's a small effort on the ground for the U.S. and there haven't been casualties or not significant casualties, you're able to carry on these things. Um, so, um, but I, I, I think that um, with the diversion or the switch of energies and resources to Pacific, which is where, which is the big challenge now for the Pentagon now, and everybody's trying to get in on it, all the services and special operations forces, um, whatever we do in Africa and the Middle East is going to have to be an economy of effort sort of thing. And it lends itself to these advisory teams of special forces or special operations type things or advisory elements coupled with U.S. reconnaissance and air power. That continues to be a mission. I was down in Fort Bragg not so long ago. That continues to be a mission for U.S. Uh, special forces uh, and the A teams, which are likely to be expanded from 12 to 16 to take on some additional capabilities. So it's, um, uh, you know, the, um, uh, I understand all the energies focused on China. I've been writing about that and, and all the, and that's a significant challenge. It's going to take a decade or longer to fully carry out in terms of building deterrent capability. AUKUS is the submarine deal with Australia's, uh, part of that in the long term but when he was a uh, defense secretary or immediately afterwards perhaps uh robert gates said that the u.s uh, had a uh, um perfect uh track record of predicting the next war it was wrong in a hundred percent of the cases <laughs> except for the wars that we started ourselves 
And um, and so what you have to keep in mind is that's why I think you some adapted version of by, with, and through as a model has utility because we don't know where the next uh, war challenge is going to come from. And in fact, um, if if the U.S. strategy in the Pacific is successful, it won't be with China because we will deter China from making a move on Taiwan or 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 being more aggressive, and therefore, by definition, it will come elsewhere. And uh, and so, how are we going to deal with that? And with what forces? Since the majority will be consecrated to the Pacific and Europe, um, you know that's where you begin to look at at these kind of models. And then, as I said, they even have um, some applicability in great power scenarios. If you don't want American troops to go toe to toe against a nuclear armed power, you're going to have to work with partner forces and be a little bit of a distance. So we've had several questions about civilian casualties during the ISIS conflict. And of course, there was a, a post-conflict humanitarian uh, disaster for many of the civilians who were caught in the fighting. So what was the role that the U.S. played with its partner forces in terms of trying to minimize civilian casualties, especially in the urban fighting and to what extent did the U.S. work with the Iraqi government to try to deal with the people who were displaced and homeless after the after the fall of Mosul? These are that's a very important question, and I'm glad it was asked. I, I meant to address that. So, how many civilian casualties were there in um, in Iraq and Syria? By the U.S. military count, it's about 1,400, which, to my mind, is a pretty high number, 1,400 innocent civilians, but that's almost certainly a, a gross underestimate. And uh, some of the uh, civilian organizations, air wars, have, I think claimed as high as 8,000. That's probably an overestimate based on social media reporting. So it, it's somewhere in between. And why were there so many civilian casualties? Because when it comes to actually uh, dropping uh, ordinance, there are a lot of restrictions on it. Um, you know, they, it's accepted that in a horrible war, there can be some civilian casualties. But if they knew there were civilians in um, a structure, they either didn't hit it or they tried to uh, hit it with the absolute minimum. I, when they went after the um, oil tankers in Syria, which was um, an operation I described uh, in the book, um, and the um, they it was held up for some period of time because they they didn't want to, they they were drivers of the trucks, and there was concern that if they hit the trucks, they'd kill the drivers, and while the drivers were working for ISIS, they weren't ISIS, perhaps, and maybe they were kind of innocent, and how do you do it? And they put together a whole plan to do it at night when the drivers would be sleeping elsewhere and to drop leaflets beforehand and, and all of that. But um, there still were a lot of civilian casualties, and here's why. First of all, um, urban warfare is and the warfare in Mosul was probably the most significant urban warfare since the Second World War, is just uh, really um, intense. Um, and uh, um, and it's just, I saw it. It's, you know, you have these concrete structures. You don't know who's inside of them. ISIS is firing out of them. Who else is in there? Uh, who's in the basement? Um, and uh, it's just a very difficult situation. And and initially, the Iraqi government counseled its citizens to stay in place and not to flee because they were concerned they wouldn't be adequate refugee camps, which they eventually there were uh, for them. Uh, and then they became the uh, Iraqi military commanders became uneasy about this. And sometimes people would try to flee, and ISIS wouldn't leave them flee. So let them flee. So the urban warfare is one reason, and the other reason is, and this was a trade off. Um, the Iraqi uh, ground forces, Peshmerga forces, and Syrian forces, um, partner forces, they're not as proficient as US troops. And um, they're not doing maneuver warfare. And um, as much firepower as the US military relies on to move forward, these guys required a lot more. And they were reluctant to move uh, without significant US air power. So we used a lot more, US used a lot more air by way of airstrikes and air power than I think it would have used for its own troops just to keep the thing moving. And the Iraqis would move forward. They'd stimulate a response from ISIS. They'd call for an airstrike. There'd be an airstrike. Then they move forward again. 
And uh, that tended to be um, the cycle. And so, you know, American society, I think, um, implicitly accepted a trade-off where um, the uh, American military casualties would be held to a minimum 20 KIA, a small number for that kind of operation. Um, uh, by relying on a partner force, it required a lot of firepower to advance, thereby inherently in increasing the risk of um, civilian uh, casualties. And uh, what uh, the Pentagon is uh, trying to figure out now is how do you how do you mitigate that in the future? You can't eliminate it, but you could mitigate it. And um, I don't know exactly what the answer would be, but I think it would be. Uh, a, you could have more intelligence resources and ISR devoted to it. You could um, try to make more uh, adjustments and corrections along the way uh, if you saw a situation uh, was going to be, um, uh, could involve um, risks of, you know, civilian casualty. You could put more people involved in that effort um, instead of just small cells of people who count up the civilian casualties. You could make it. Uh, a more important line of effort, but there there was a Pentagon effort to to take a look at this, and there's debate between human rights community and and the Pentagon as to whether it goes far enough. But what I think the lesson is is when you rely on a partner force, there's a greater risk of civilian casualties, mm -hmm. and therefore you have to have more thought has to go into to how to mitigate that. Now that's a very important point. Uh, I encourage uh, other participants to ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, Michael, one of the inside parts of the book is the uh, dynamics within the U.S. military as the U.S. government tried to figure out how to structure command for this, for the Inherent Resolve campaign. And you talk about the uh, tensions between the generals over who's in charge and what the chain of command is. And I would like you to talk about that and say something about whether that's just the normal bureaucratics or whether there's something particular about this type of campaign that lends itself to tensions within the military uh, command structure. Everywhere I've covered, there have been tensions among the, the, the generals. In this case, um, there were some uh, significant ones. And um, uh, one of them was between um, General McFarlane, who was the um, the commander when they began to turn the um, strategy around, and actually Lloyd Austin, who was then the CENTCOM commander, and it was and who was um, um, careful, uh, cautious, his critics would say cautious to a fault, but he was trying to keep the Obama White House on board. And there were there were tensions between the two over um, the degree of latitude General McFarlane should have and the pace of the campaign. Um, and uh, I think McFarlane was proved right in, his, in in how he tried to plan it. So there were there were those kind of tensions. At one point, the Air Force became very frustrated uh, at, at how air power was being used because they felt it was not being used strategically. And David Goldfein, who was the Air Force Chief of Staff, actually proposed to General Joe Dunford, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, that the Air Force take over the war, and because these commands are always run by the Army, because they have core headquarters, they just stick in there. And the um, and so, well, let us do it. You know, this is, it's moving too slow. And Dunford never, a Marine, never took that one too seriously. And the Air Force campaign was uh, later uh, elaborated uh, a bit. So uh, there were um, those kind of tensions, but nothing that I think um, no serious, serious ruptures. Um, it was um, and, and uh, um, you know for a campaign like that. There, there's another interesting element we haven't talked about, which is pertinent to today, which is the Russians. And, um, you know, we had that drone incident yesterday where a Russian airplane clipped the um, propeller of, um, of a Reaper drone and, um, and, uh, and which then fell into the Black Sea. But uh, right now, 
Um, the Russians are flying more aggressively in Syria too. I mean, the airspace in Syria is shared between um, the US and, and the Russian Air Force. Um, and they have a deconfliction line. Um, and at times the situation's been pretty tense. And I recount an episode where a Russian general and told the Americans they had to vacate the Altamf garrison or what, and General Townsend came back and asked if this was a threat because they would fight if, if it was, and it turned out not to be. And then of course, there was a famous incident with the Wagner Group, which had a couple hundred of its uh, personnel try to make a push into Eastern Syria, and most of them were killed uh, by the US um, and, uh, and to keep them from advancing into SDF and American uh, controlled territory. So far, those, those tensions, US-Russian tensions have been managed, um, but uh, it's interesting. I've talked to commanders not so long ago and they say the Russians are flying more aggressively in Syria and they're not, where previously they had notified some of their overflights over Al Tamf when they bring in transport planes. Now they're not doing that. Um, so there is the potential there uh, for a, a Black Sea type incident. So I have a, a one of the uh, participants ask a question about the current uh, DOD role inside Iraq and in particular the relationship between DOD and the local forces. And the question is whether or not that the U.S. plans to transition that relationship to a more normal security cooperation, or are there constraints in terms of what Washington or Baghdad are prepared to do uh, in terms of the U.S. military role inside Iraq? So the U.S. military role inside Iraq is... Um, is uh, we're talking about 2,500 troops. It's they're not out in the field. They're not accompanying the way they were in the Mosul fight. They pulled back to the headquarters. They're doing a lot of their mentoring from there. So it's not as obtrusive or obvious as it as it was. And um, I was reading the latest in, uh, Pentagon Inspector General report. I think which is on the Operation Inherent Resolve, which is on the Pentagon website. You can find it. And it basically indicates the Iraqis can't stand on their own two feet just yet. And, um, and uh, for example, um, the airstrikes that the Iraqis are carrying out using F-16s, well, they're relying heavily on American ISR, intelligence events and reconnaissance to help uh, identify the targets. And so, and they still rely to a significant extent on um, Western contractor support uh, to maintain their equipment. And you can just have to ask yourself how comfortable contractors are going to be staying in Balad or, well, they're not in Balad, but staying up in Erbil and all these other places if there's not an American or coalition, it's not just American coalition uh, presence um, on the ground. So uh, they've tried to deal with the political sensitivities about this. They may recall a couple of years ago, I had a story on it early on about uh, they've declared an end to the combat mission and there was a lot of reports for taking our combat troops out. Well, really the, the troops didn't change. It was just a redescription of the, the mission. The US is not involved in carrying out the, the raids against ISIS in Iraq, Iraqis are, but they still depend on American intelligence and there's still some deficiencies uh you know in in their uh capabilities and i i guess the the race is for the iraqi forces to become self-sufficient enough um before the politics in iraq turns against this small american presence but so far it seems to be tolerated because there's a, a recognition that you know whatever different elements of their society think about the americans um Absent, absent that, uh, ISIS would have a better chance of making a comeback. Do you? I know it's hard to predict, but do you have any sense of where we are on that timeline for Iraqi forces to become sufficient? And what distinction do you make between the Peshur, Peshmerga on one hand and the Iraqi security forces and police forces on the other? Um, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, and I don't think it should. I think it's, I mean, as, as long as the Ameri as long as they accept American, as they're 
the, it seems like President Biden is comfortable leaving American forces in Iraq. He was vice president when forces came out of Iraq, and I don't think anybody liked how that turned out. So, um, and it's not a large number of forces. And um, and I think um, by describing it as a non-combat mission, that's helped. So I, I would, you know, I, I would in this, um, I'd encourage people to go through this Inspector General report. It's, it's actually pretty good. It's like, for example, they said, well, what can Iraqi ground troops not do? Well, they can't, their ground forces and their art artillery units can't integrate. They can't work well together. They, um, uh, they can't, um, there was a period of time when they were forming their government formation that payments stopped. So certain, their Cessna aircraft, that they fire hellfires from, stopped operating. Uh, the F-16s depend on American ISR um, for, um, for support. Um, so I, I think the U.S. plays, I guess, what you would call an enabling role and a useful one. It doesn't seem like they're going to be able to maintain their, that's always been a, a weakness, equipment on their own without contractor support for some time. And, and some odd events have impacted them. For example, they, the Iraqis have, have um, Russian M uh, uh, attack helicopters and transport helicopters. I've ridden in them with the Iraqis <laughs> and the, um, and the, um, well, uh, you can't get parts for those now because there are sanctions against the Russian Federation and people who trade in R Russian weapons because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I, I think it's, it's going to be a while um, before that day comes. And I, I think as long as the U.S. presence is is modest, and and um, the Iraqis are doing the heavy lifting. I, I don't see why anyone would rush to change that. We've all seen what happened when a, a vacuum was created after 2011, and it was bad for for everybody all around. Uh, Michael, I'm afraid we've run out of time. I want to thank everybody for joining us, and thank you very much for this. A uh, very incisive and insightful uh, explanation of the campaign against ISIS. For those of you who are interested, I encourage you to get a copy of the book. It, uh, in addition to being comprehensive and very detailed, it's also very readable and tells the story in a way that's very clear. So again, thank you, Michael, very much. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. And we look forward to our next uh, session, which is uh, going to be uh, uh, with Deborah Amos uh, at the uh, end of uh, March, March 29th. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.